Hi, good morning, everyone. I hope you all had a restful Thanksgiving break, and thank you for joining us for today's embargoed media briefing ahead of tomorrow's release of the results of the 2018 PISA assessment. I'm Miguel Gorman, Senior Manager for Public Affairs and Media at the OECD office here in Washington, D.C., and I'm delighted to have Andreas Schleicher, our Director for Education and Skills, leading today's briefing. Uh, there's a lot to get through, but before I hand things over to Andreas, I do want to go over some important housekeeping items. Uh, first, and most importantly, the embargo. Uh, the report, the country notes, and the contents of this briefing are under embargo until 3 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. That's 9 a.m. time in Paris. Um, that means that no stories go online before that time. If you do have a question about print editions or you need a clarification about the embargo time, please call me after this briefing on 202-822-3865. That's 202-822-3865. Uh, secondly, questions are highly encouraged during this briefing. Because we're launching this globally tomorrow, it's going to be a bit harder to get a hold of Andreas and our various uh, education experts, so this is your best opportunity. You can submit text questions to Andreas by typing uh, your questions into the pane of the control panel, and you can send your questions in at any time during the presentation. We'll collect them and uh, address them during the Q&A session after the presentation. Finally, today's PowerPoint is available for you to download in the handout section of the control uh, pane. And with that, I'm going to hand things over to Andreas, Director for Education and Skills at the OECD in Paris, who has uh, already done this briefing for Japan and the UK, I understand, so I'm very grateful to him for giving uh, some time for the US as well. Andreas, over to you. Thanks, Miguel, and good morning to everyone. Uh, let me just sort of start with a brief sort of sense of, of PISA. It's the largest assessment that we've done so far, involving 600,000 students from 79 participating countries and economies. They sat the two-hour PISA test and answered lots of questions about their context. We also collected data from school leaders in many countries from teachers and also in some from parents. Here you can see a map of the countries, how it has evolved, uh, the 79 systems. Uh, as you can see in uh, China, we have still only four provinces taking part. They make up together 100 million people, so it's quite a significant uh, provinces in China, but obviously not representative of the country as a whole. Uh, the focus was on reading reading in the digital world, uh, sort of the capacity of students to understand, navigate, evaluate, and also reflect on written texts. In uh, science, uh, the idea was to assess to what extent students can explain the world they see around them in scientific terms, design scientific inquiry, and also interpret evidence uh, in scientific terms. And in mathematics, uh, it was as much about uh, kind of the, the procedures of math as about the capacity of students to think like a mathematician, not translate you know, problems into mathematical terms, solve them and interp interpret them back in the original problem context. So that is what the test really seeks to measure. The target population is 15 year olds to be precise. Uh, students at the time of testing aged between 15 years and three months and 16 years and two months. And we took students from any form of education, whether they were full-time or part-time enrolled in academic or vocational programs in public or private, basically all 15-year-olds enrolled in an institution, they are part of the PISA target population. That being said, there are always, and there were very strict standards and criteria for when students uh, could be excluded so that we are pretty confident in the comparability of the results. Now, that being said, there are always cases where not everybody is part of the population. Some students are no longer enrolled in school or have not enrolled. Some uh, schools uh, were excluded because they were not reachable and so on. So uh, here you can see the share of 15-year-olds who were actually covered by PISA. And you can see it ranges from you know close to 100% to, in some cases, a uh, minority of students. That's very important to keep in mind. Huh? Uh, I give you an example. You take the four provinces in China that has always been in the past, you know, 
uh, uh, noted that uh, there were you know, some of the 15 year olds not enrolled in school, so that might influence the results. But you know, if you look at this for the United States, the situation is not so different. Now you talk about you know, 82% in one case, 86% in the other case. Uh, these are quite typical numbers. And what I also would like to say is in most countries actually do better. Now, so I say this here because I have heard sometimes people saying, well, you know, in the United States, we test everyone, but other countries are not. Actually, as you can see from this chart, most countries have uh, wider coverage than the United States has, but some have, uh, of course, less coverage. Let's talk about the results. You know, when you think about the period between 2000 and 2003, that was when reading was still in the kind of old print world, you know, reading about you know, textbooks, linear texts mainly. But then, you know, the world became gradually digitally. Uh, remember, 2006 was the year before the iPhone was invented. And that was the year where we didn't have uh, results for the United States in reading because of an anomaly in the kind of test booklets. But, you know, uh, soon after, actually, we got back on track. We had in the United States actually starting again with the 2009 assessment. You can see that in the red line. And again, the world is becoming increasingly digital that's the time we started to speak with our smartphone and so on and when you look at the last few years you know big data cloud computing you know biogenetics uh, uh, virtual reality robotics have clearly changed the way in which students read and what students read uh, the digital world has become the real world but actually if you look at this chart over time we have not seen actually much change neither in the united states nor in the industrialized world the oecd countries now pretty much the reading skills of 15 year olds in 2018 look very similar to the reading skills of students in the year 2000. Uh, in the united states we have about 13.5 percent of students who were good at distinguishing between fact and opinion in some very complex tasks now where basically students had to use implicit cues that related to the content or the sources of information. So these were not simple tasks, but you have basically 13.5% of students uh, who can manage those tasks. That's better than the OECD average, which is around 10%, actually slightly less than 10%. And that obviously in the world in which we live today is very important. In the world of you know fake news, it's very important that students can actually navigate ambiguity and uh, uh, resolve conflicting kind of pieces of information and written tests, but uh, it's only 13.5% who can do that, which is better than the OECD average, but probably not what you would like to see. It's up from 10% in the year 2000, so that's a part of the distribution where we did see improvements in the United States, but at the same time, we've also seen a rising share of low-performing students in that period, but the average has remained pretty kind of stable. But I want to show you, relative to the OECD average, some countries where we actually did see some really interesting progress. First of all, the four provinces in China, they topped the league table in reading. Uh, only Singapore is sort of non-measurably different from them. But you can see very clearly very strong outcomes in those four provinces. Singapore is interesting in that it did start well in 2009 and kept improving. No. Estonia has made it to the top among the OECD countries, the best performing OECD country on the PISA test by now, continuous improvement. You have a country like Portugal that's steadily moved forward, now sort of comparable to the OECD average or Poland. Also very interesting example of a system that kept you know, moving forward in education starting in the year 2000. At the low end of the performance spectrum, you can look to countries like Peru or Albania with very significant and consistent improvements. Then we have countries like Brazil and Turkey where improvements have perhaps not been so impressive. But if you take a country like Turkey, the share of 15-year-olds enrolled in school has doubled from 36% to 73%. So it's actually interesting that they got more children into school and at the same time also improved the quality of their reading skills. Now, so that's in a nutshell sort of the kind of trends, the positive trends, some of the positive trends that we have seen. You'll find them analyzed in detail in the publication. I want to highlight Sweden also where you can see basically 
they saw for many years real and significant declines on PISA. But since 2012, they've caught the ball again and are seeing now again rising learning outcomes. Now, and basically, that gets you to where the rank order of countries is today. You get you know, four provinces in China and Singapore at the top, and then you get you know way down to countries like the Philippines and Dominican Republic. Large uh, variability. I have here the trends among countries. Now you can see basically in the United States and reading mathematics and science stability. I mark that here in yellow. Up in the table, you can see the countries that have seen improvements consistently so, and sometimes in some areas and others not. And then at the lower end in red, you see the countries that uh, marked by the red dots that have seen uh, declines in the learning outcomes in the domains that PISA measures. Here you have a sort of more detailed picture of the United States relative to the OECD average. You can see basically in reading a little bit of fluctuation, but essentially the score in 2000 is the same as it is in the 2018. Uh, if you look to a mathematics, this is an area where American students have always struggled and uh, uh, perhaps, um, again, you know, we, I would not call any of those changes significant. It's basically a trend line that has been fairly stable, but significantly below the OECD average. Now, and then you can look to science, uh, where you can see uh, certainly the gap between OECD countries and uh, the US has moved in a more positive direction. But again, you know, uh, uh, performance overall is quite steady. That's the broad kind of picture. Uh, you can also look at learning outcomes by decile of social background. The red dot illustrates the students from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, the 10% students from the internationally most disadvantaged backgrounds, the green triangle, the students from the most privileged backgrounds. And you can see <coughs> there is an achievement gap, but it's not actually exceptional. I'm saying this because, again, that's often against, you know, uh, popular belief. Uh, there is a big achievement gap in the United States, but it's not exceptionally large. But what's also interesting, you can look at the 10% of the most disadvantaged students in, you know, Beijing, Shanghai, Jiangsu, Zhejiang, or uh, in Macau, or Estonia, and you can see that those students actually do as well or better than the average student in the United States. So clearly some countries do a lot better with their most disadvantaged students, whereas you see less variability among students uh, from the most privileged backgrounds. Now, the United States is sort of quite as good as, you know, Estonia and so on wouldn't be very, very different. So that's basically learning outcomes by decile of social background. Another uh, point that we look at is how much of the performance variation is actually between schools. No. And um, you can see in the United States, that's just about 20%. Now, most of the variability in learning outcomes is actually within schools. So it's not so easy to pinpoint a few schools and say that's where all the problems come from. That's something you could do in Israel or in Lebanon or the Netherlands or Bulgaria, United Arab Emirates. Now, that most of the variability lies between schools. But in the case, case of the United States, you talk about, you know, a relatively small share of the performance differences that lie between schools. There's just a lot of variability of learning outcomes in many schools, in many areas. Uh, you can get up to Finland, you know, where there is just about six, seven percent of performance variation between schools. So the closest school is always the best school in Finland. Now, whether you are in the, you know, sparsely populated north of Finland or in the center of Helsinki, the capital, you cannot see much of a difference in the in the in, in the quality of schooling. So, uh, money. You can see the United States is broadly in line when you look at spending versus outcomes. Uh, this is something that flattens off. You don't see much of a relationship between investment and the quality of learning outcomes. Uh, uh, the same is true when you look at learning time and learning outcomes. Here in blue, you see the hours that students spend learning in school per week, and in yellow, the learning time they spend out of school. And you can see that varies hugely across countries. You know, take the United Arab Emirates, where students spend close to 60 hours learning per week, and then you go to the left side, where this is a little bit more than half than that in Finland. So 
big variability in the quantity of learning time. But when you look at productivity, the learning gains per hour of instruction, you can see in countries like Finland or Germany, students learn a lot in very little time, whereas in the United Arab Emirates, students learn relatively little in a lot of time. And the United States also is among the countries where you could argue that actually learning time is not so bad, but actually the quality of that learning time could probably be improved more. The sort of productivity is below the OECD average. And that even holds for countries like Singapore. You know, they do really well on the PISA test, but that is largely an issue of volume. Whereas actually, again, if you divide that by the number of hours spent, uh, Singapore could see also their improvements in productivity. Now, that's where countries on the left side, you know, Finland, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, Estonia, and so on, are particularly good at. Now, learning outcomes are always the product of quantity and quality of learning time. Yeah. Uh, so that was sort of in a nutshell what we see in terms of performance. Uh, we also studied some background uh, constructs. Growth mindset was for the first time a question in PISA. Now, to what extent do students believe in talent as a kind of or intelligence, inborn intelligence as a source of success versus, you know, effort and so on. And obviously it's an important construct. And what's interesting, you can see actually the two relate quite well, both within countries, but also across countries. And the American students come out pretty well on growth mindset and also quite okay on reading performance. So you can see actually that relationships holds quite systematically. And remember Estonia, top performer in the OECD area, also top performer on the gross mindset construct. Then Indonesia, where you can see fewer students believing in this growth, growth mindset and also fewer students doing so well on the PISA assessment. So it's a contra construct that uh, correlates within and also across countries with learning outcomes. We also see that students who hold a gross mindset in PISA are more inclined to motivate to uh, are more motivated to master complex tasks, have a greater sense of you know believing their own abilities, are less afraid of failure, are more committed to ambitious learning goals, and also see more of an instrumental value in going to school. So gross mindset is not just related to performance, but also to important student attitudes. What's interesting when you look at the relationship with achievement, you can see it's stronger for girls, it's stronger for the disadvantage, and it's stronger for students with an immigrant background. So for certain groups, growth mindset seems to be more closely related to achievement than uh, for others. Uh, you see the relationship here is just by country. You can see it exists in virtually every country and in the United States is uh, most closely pronounced. You basically can say that uh, students who disagree that, uh, or strongly disagree that intelligence can't uh, change very much are basically uh, almost 60 score points on the PISA test. That's about you know one and a half school years in the countries for which we can measure that. So it's a pretty big difference. Uh, that is explained in the case of the United States and uh, in many other countries as well. We also looked at some more general life outcomes, uh, the sense of belonging, not to what extent is school a place where I feel I belong, I make friends easily, things like this. This is not very well uh, established in the United States according to the responses that students give us. It's always you know, hard to measure those things objectively, but sense of belonging, was less pronounced than in many other countries. Now, Spain comes out first on this. We also see that students expressed a quite low level of satisfaction with their lives now, compared with other countries. Now, in absolute terms, the numbers may look quite good. You talk about two thirds of students who say they're generally satisfied with their life, but um, <clears throat> actually um, you can see it's a lot lower than it is in the majority of countries for which we have comparative data. Uh, we also ask students you know, to what extent they see some meaning in life and also that is a variable where uh, actually here I have the United Kingdom but also in the United States is uh, on the lower end of the performance spectrum, at least not sort of among the countries uh, with very strong sort of sense of meaning in life. So the question of course is to what extent those constructs relate to what's going on in school as opposed to being factors that are unrelated to school. 
the first thing that we've measured is to what extent students feel that the teacher supports them. Now they feel that the teacher, you know, understands when students struggle, that they care for each and every student in the classroom, questions like this. And there you can see it's moderate in the United States, but not as strong as this perception of teacher support as you would find it in some of the countries. Now, uh, teacher enthusiasm, the same. It's actually not bad, according to students. You know, my teacher is very enthusiastic about the subject they teach, about teaching others a class. Uh, but you can see also there on the left side, you can see students where, which express a greater sense of teacher enthusiasm. Now, does it matter actually where students agreed uh, that their teachers were more enthusiastic? Uh, you could see that reading outcomes were better. Now, for example, it was clear to me that the teacher liked teaching us. You could see that seems to be positively related with reading outcomes, or it was clear that the teacher likes to deal with the topic of the lesson. Now, again, things that we can actually relate to the PISA performance. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, we don't understand, we don't know what the causal nature of that relationship is, but it's interesting that you can see those kinds of things. We also saw that where students saw more teacher enthusiasm, they also talked about a better disciplinary climate no, and also more perseverance uh, to motivate complex tasks. Now, those things also seem to be quite strongly related. So teacher enthusiasm seems to be related to our learning outcomes, but also to the more general school and disciplinary climate in the classroom. We looked at to what extent students enjoy reading. Now that's very important today. It's not just you know what you do for your teacher and in school, but is that something you're gonna take away from school to, uh, in life? Now, and we could see, for example, teacher enthusiasm, teacher stimulation of reading engagement, teacher directed instruction, a fairly kind of structured classroom, teacher feedback, adaptive instruction that responds to differences in student needs and also again this perception of teacher support they all were positively related to the enjoyment of reading now you may tell me well that's all an artifact of students who read better also enjoying reading more but even if you control for reading performance you see pretty much the same picture so there's something that is really interesting going on here. Enjoyment of reading somehow relating to what is actually happening in school, not just a personal attribute or something that we can actually predict if we understand the learning environment in school. Uh, when you look at this more broadly across countries, you can see where uh, school principals say teachers not meeting individual students' needs is hindering learning. You can see the more that is the case, the less well students perform, where there is teacher absenteeism, same thing, where teachers are not well prepared for classes according to principles, not them perceiving that this is hindering learning. You can see also that learning outcomes lower, where teachers are being too strict with students, same kind of relationship. So those are factors, this principle's perception about those problems seem to be actually related to the quality of learning outcomes. I want to come back to school uh, students' life satisfaction because it's really interesting that the students' sense of life satisfaction <coughs> is actually predicted by some of the school factors. Now, so it's not just you know a personal attribute, I'm happy with life or not, but you can actually say where there was a better disciplinary climate, students were happier with their lives, even after accounting for social background. Where there was less prevalence of bullying, same thing where there was a stronger sense of belonging among students, you could see also students were more happy with their lives. Index of teacher support, teacher feedback, same thing. No. Last but not least, we also looked sort of at the kind of learning styles and you could see where there was a more cooperative learning uh, approach in the school. You could see also there students being happier with their lives. No. A little positive relationship also on competition, but mainly on a cooperative learning style. And this is something where countries actually vary a lot. You know, that's really interesting that those things are not just you know, different among different students, but you can see, for example, in the Netherlands, in Denmark, in Japan, in Germany, the kind of cooperative learning styles dominate, whereas in the United States, number one, or Malta, or Brazil, or United Kingdom, you have a more competitive learning environment being dominating. So those things actually vary across countries with lots of systems in the middle. 
What's interesting is that uh, you shouldn't pit you know, one against the other. You can see the cooperative learning style is positively related uh, to reading performance, but also the competitive style, at least some aspects, relate positively to reading outcomes. Now, so competition and cooperation seem to be things that go together, but the kind of learning environments seem to be quite different across countries, with one uh, stronger often than the other. Last but not least, we can see that internet use out of school uh, uh, when it's very high. You know, when I talk about high internet users, you know, that's more than 30 hours per week. And uh, you can see that's the point where uh, uh, positive feelings are on the decline. You know, whether it's about happiness, liveliness, proudness, joyfulness, cheerfulness, they all, bars all get shorter for high internet users and heavy internet users. And the same for negative feeling, being scared, feeling miserable, being afraid, feeling sad, and so on. So heavy internet use seems to be quite consistently across countries, negative related to student feelings. So la last but not least, let me bring you back to the issue of social inclusion equity. Now, what you can see is that across countries, disadvantaged students are less likely to expect to go on or complete university education, and that's true for all countries. In the United States, most students have expectation to complete university, so that's where the United States is different, but even there, you can see the green triangle, privileged students from privileged backgrounds is higher than the, <clears throat> than the red square from the disadvantaged fields. Uh, what is actually perhaps more interesting here is here, because before you could say, well, you know, disadvantage is entangled with performance. So it's at the end of the day, it's the high performers who want to go to university education. But it's not so clear. For example, here I show you the high performing students in mathematics or science who want to come uh, be science and engineering professionals. So they are both, both boys and girls are doing very, very well in math and science. So have the potential to go to engineering. But you can see in the case of the United States, if you are a boy, you are much more likely to say that you expect to work as a science or engineering professional than if you're a girl. And that's true for many countries, but not for all. Actually, Eastern Europe, you can see actually the, the, the two, two symbols are very close to each other. So it's not true for all countries. In some countries, gender aspirations are not, you know, so much by subject area. But in the case of the United States, you can say, well, if you take a high performing boy and a high performing girl, the boy is much more likely to aspire to a science and engineering profession. And it goes in the other way when you look at other types of profession. So school systems generally have done well to close gender gaps in science performance. Now in the United States, you don't see sort of a major gap between boys and girls in science. But when you look to this kinds of social emotional attachment to science is a quite different gender gap. On immigration, I think uh, this is a very positive picture. When you look, for example, at the performance of students without an immigrant background in blue, uh, it's not very different from the performance of second generation immigrants. Now, basically, you can say if you are born in the United States, even if you come from an immigrant background by age 15, you will have very much the same reading performance than students uh, without an immigrant background. That's not sort of so clear for the first generation. Now you can see a slight performance uh, drop, but even that is smaller than in many other countries. So I think this big strength of the United States that actually immigration doesn't seem to be a drag on the quality of learning outcomes in the education system. That being said, you know, uh, the PISA data also show a clear compounding of disadvantage. If you come from a disadvantaged background, you are less likely to exhibit the growth mindset. You're less likely to positive feeling. You are less satisfied with your life. You show a lower sense of belonging. You are more exposed to bullying and so on. So those factors, except for teacher support, that's really interesting. Students in disadvantaged areas often sense a greater level of teacher support, whether this is perceived or real, very difficult to say but mostly you can see the odds are stacked against students from disadvantage. And actually that's, odds, except in a few countries, actually that's also interesting. For example, if you go to the four provinces in China, the most disadvantaged students have uh, even a better level of growth mindset than students from privileged backgrounds. If you go to Poland, even the disadvantaged students offer a great sense of belonging. Or if you go to Morocco or to Israel or to Panama, you have students from disadvantage, 
uh, feeling their teachers to be very enthusiastic. So that's interesting that, you know, on general, that's the pattern, but not everybody. Students' exposure to bullying. Now that's this, there's a self reports. It's slightly above average in the United States, but not on the extreme. Uh, academic resilience. Now, to what extent, if you come from a disadvantaged background, are you ending up to become a top performer in the uh, United States? And there you can see resilience is not so great in the United States. If you go to the left side, you have much greater percentages of students who, despite coming from disadvantage, end up to be top performers. So, you know, people who jump the grade and actually beat the odds, that's not so common in the United States as it is in a number of other countries. Now, uh, what is interesting is that uh, student resilience relates to gross mindset. Now, basically, if you take the share of academically resilient students between those who have that gross mindset and those who say they don't, you can really see it's a big kind of difference. So uh, resilience overall is not so great in the United States, but where students have a gross mindset, they're much more likely to demonstrate this. When you look at the academically resilient immigrant students, you know, students with an immigrant background from a disadvantaged background who achieve good results, we can see that's correlated with parents' emotional support, uh, with teacher enthusiasm, self-efficacy, the disciplinary climate in the school, and so on. And also, again, with this growth mindset. So we can see some of the factors that seem to predict, you know, resilience among immigrant students. Let me talk finally about school systems, you know, where there is a, a fair degree of social segregation. But when you look at the United States, you know, that's actually not segregation between public and private schools. No, that's basically the blue bar here. That's quite short. Most of the segregation that you see in the United States is actually within the public uh, part of the schools. So it's, it's, it's public schools dividing students by social background, not public and private schools. And actually, it's true in most countries for which we have comparable data. I think it's an important finding because we often attribute segregation to, you know, the management of schools, but actually there's a lot of segregation within the public school sector. Very last point to make is that uh, the United States, like many other systems, are not very good in aligning resources with needs. If you come from a more disadvantaged background, you're much more prone to experience a shortage of education staff or a shortage of education material. That is true in the United States, but it's also true in uh, uh, most of the countries. Now, most countries are in the red uh, uh, sh shaded area, which is where basically disadvantaged background is you know doubled up with a disadvantaged school environment there are very few countries in the green area where you can say disadvantaged schools have you know better material or sometimes also staff uh, resources no? um, so that's in a nutshell the main results from PISA if you put it all together uh, you can see the United States in terms of learning outcomes is, is slightly above the OECD average no? except for mathematics uh, when it comes to equity, it's sort of in the middle of the chart, not so much to the right side, uh, chart, where basically quality and equity uh, go together. I want to leave it here so that you have enough time for questions. Thank you so much, Andreas. And just as a reminder, if folks want to ask questions, you can either send it through the uh, question tab during the Q&A. If you'd rather ask it live during the uh, this Q&A portion, please feel free to do so. Uh, I'm going to attempt to uh, unmute a microphone to uh, have our first question. Uh, let's have a look to see if this works. Uh, Tonel, please go ahead if you can. Oh, hi. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Um, I'm Tano Hobbs with the Wall Street Journal. I am wondering if you could give an overview of the performance for the U.S. from 2015 to 2018. It appears there were gains. Um, let me just get back. Uh, there you have them. And... Uh... So there you can see the the performance 2000. Um, <clears throat> basically, if you look in, in reading, it's really flat. There is nothing that is significant. 
If you look to mathematics, also there's a little bit of fluctuation, but we do not see any of that significant. If you look to science and you compare directly the 2006 and 2018 figures, that's where you could detect a small statistically significant improvement. No? That's basically the picture as it is. So are you saying there was no significant improvement from 2015 to 2018 in the three subjects? Uh, no. Okay. Thank you. Not in a way that is, you know, significant at the 95% confidence level, which is what we are using at the OCD. Thank you so much. Uh, we will go to our next question from Mariah. Please go ahead if you uh, can hear us. Hi, this is Mariah Belingit from the Washington Post. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, so Peggy Carr from NCES uh, indicated that there are growing indications of or growing disparities between high and low performing students in the US. And I was wondering where we might find that data um, if you're seeing that in other countries and also why the OECD might be concerned about disparities. Yeah, you do see this. I, I referred to that briefly when I spoke about the share of high performing and low performing school students. You could see that actually in, in reading the share of students at the top end of the distribution level five and six has increased, but we've also seen a slight increase at the bottom end. And that polarization is something that we have seen in a fair number of countries. It's not always related to a social background. For example, I, I do not have data to show that social inequality in the United States has grown. Uh, that's true in other countries. It's not what we observe, but performance inequality is clearly more visible now than it has uh, been in the past. Uh, should we be worried about this? Uh, I do think so because you know the our labor markets were a lot more tolerant to educational failure in the past than they are now. So I think uh, students who do not uh, make the grade uh, face pretty grim prospects. And you know when you don't reach level. Uh, you know, uh, two on the PISA test, uh, that's a pretty kind of uh, dark subject for your fu educational future. That's the kind of reading skills you'd expect from a 10 year old child. Sort of, these are not about, you know, uh, advanced information processing skills, but very technical reading skills that are missing often. You know? And I also was curious to know I know it's always difficult for me to count because um, you're grouping like um, regions and countries together. Where exactly does the U.S. rank um, in each of the categories in terms, of, not just in OECD countries, but just among countries? Yeah, we have, you know, uh, it depends how you count this, whether you count it as a system, as a country. Uh, you'll find that in table 1.4.4, different forms of, of rankings, really. Uh, and often we, we give you a range of ranks because it's often difficult to say with very high precision because there's always a kind of measurement error involved. But basically, that's the best table where you can find uh, that information. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we have another question uh, from Dana Goldstein. Hopefully, Dana, uh, your microphone is working. Otherwise, I can uh, ask your question to Andreas. Can you hear me right now? Yes, we yes. can. OK, so my question is, how do you compare students' reading results, uh, given that they're working in different languages? It's often said that English is you know, more difficult to learn, especially for young sure. children. And uh, I, maybe that's not uh, so important by the time they get to 15. But can yeah. you discuss um, what goes into that, those comparisons? Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, obviously, uh, students uh, operate in very different languages, and the cultural context may vary a lot. Um, still, the kind of reading skills that we measure, uh, I would argue, can be compared to the kind of tasks that students master. And uh, uh, I do not, there is actually, there have been quite detailed studies on the relative complexity and difficulty of, of, of languages. Uh, the, you know, some people would argue, well, English is uh, more difficult because it's less phonetic. Others would argue, actually, you know, the grammatical complexity of English is much less so than in, it is in, in, you know, if you take Russian or German, uh, uh, you certainly, you know, you have 28 characters rather than 4,000 that you would have in Chinese. So I think there are different factors impacting on the relative complexity and difficulty of language. The relative precision of a language is another one. And uh, so those factors may vary, but still, 
you can say that you know students will have to work in their in their in their language in their country so the type of reading tasks that we measure are pretty invariant to that so um, that's the only answer i can i can give to this and um, of course some students were tested in the second language for example uh, singaporean students when they do the english test that's often their second language they still do very very well on that um, but um, i think that's so in a, in a way i can we, we can say that the, the, there is task invariance you know when you have to you know uh, compare and contrast two texts and, uh, or get information out of a table uh, those tasks are the same in different languages but the relative features of the languages could make the tasks in that context you know more or less difficult Thank but you. it's a good question you know i think that's a, that's the point that our reading experts have struggled with for 20 years to ensure that the tasks that we pose are invariant across languages and you can test that actually you can look at the relative difficulty of each of the pizza tasks and ensure that uh, that difficulty is the same across the different language groups okay thank you okay uh next we go over to andrew van damme andrew uh hopefully your microphone is working yeah howdy thanks for taking my questions can you all hear me yes Yes, we can. Great. All right. This is Andrew from the Post. And uh, can I call PISA a low stakes exam? Yes. And uh, what measures do you all take to weed out students who aren't taking uh, the exam seriously, who are, you know, um, not answering questions, answering randomly, that kind of thing. I've heard, for example, that you might uh, drop unanswered questions at the end of the test. Actually, um, there are several things that we do on this. Uh, we have a question on test most motivation where we ask students directly. We treat, uh, we have now an adaptive version of the test. So basically students getting different questions and also uh, depending on their ability. So we treat all uh, not answered questions as missing. We are measuring the ability of students on the questions that they have answered. You're quite right, PISA is a low stakes test and we intentionally design it to be a low stakes test because we're really not interested under what could you achieve under maximum of pressure in a very specific you know, time bound situation. We're very much interested in what performance would students show in a uh, realistic kind of context and situation because that's what counts in life you know and most of the tasks that you do in life are low stakes tasks but performance really matters so that's the idea of the PISA test uh, to actually keep the stakes for individual students uh, very low and then measure the extent to which students take the test serious we actually don't have uh, many students uh, providing random responses we check for that we typically students take that test Seriously, you would pick up random, we use item response models here, you will pick up very quickly when a student responds in a way that is not consistent with their measured ability. No, and we do not actually, we have, the, the, the models come out quite robust and they do come out robust across countries. So there is not much evidence for variation in response behavior uh, across countries. Okay, follow up with that. Uh, across countries, are, say I want to convince somebody uh, skeptical of the test's validity across countries, are there parallel measures like perhaps the Tim's exam on math that uh, it, it correlates with that I can use to um, buttress that? Yeah, you know, I mean, the Tim's uh, test is uh, looking at slightly different kind of um, content. It's more focused on subject matter content, where, whereas PISA is more focused on the capacity of students to apply that content and use that content, extrapolate from that content. But broadly, you'll find uh, those tests coming up with quite similar results uh, if you look at the same age groups. Now, I think the relative position of the United States, for example, is not that uh kind kind of different uh, but this issue about the uh, stakes has often been asked you know to what extent do students take uh, you know low stakes learning situations tests uh differently serious i must say we have not found 
a lot of evidence suggesting that this varies across countries any more than it would vary in life. You know, it's probably uh, fair to say that there are some countries where people generally are very diligent. You know, you go to Singapore, it's not just, you know, in a test taking situation, but you go to the train station, you go to, I mean, everywhere, people are just, you know, very conscientious and very diligent. That's probably a feature that is much more ingrained in that country than it is just, you know, a reflection of the stakes of a test. So there, there will be cultural features of response behavior. But as I said, we couldn't find, we, we didn't find uh, erratic kind of response pattern that would have, you know, violated the item response models that we put under the PISA data. Okay, thank you all. Uh, we have another question coming in uh, from Kathy Rubin. Uh, this was the first year that OECD tested for global competency. The US did not participate. Can you comment on what those countries who participated learned from the experience? Yeah, actually, those data are still not processed. We're going to publish this data only in October uh, next year. Um, and uh, so I don't have any, any information yet on that. I can tell you that there have been uh, about uh, 54, 55 countries that took the global competency questionnaire. There have been around, I think, 18 who did an additional test. Um, but again, I don't have any results yet. Okay. Uh, there's still some time for questions. If um, you guys have any other queries, feel free to uh, even just to say, I have a question in the, uh, in the Q&A box and I can unmute your line. Or if you don't have a microphone, uh, feel free to type out the, the full question. Okay, we have another question from Mariah. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Mariah again. I just wanted to follow up on my colleague's inquiry. Um, are there any non-standardized test measures that suggest that the U.S. has uh, fallen behind what we you know, typically consider our peers, um, places like China and Singapore? Um, are there um, anything else? Uh, what do you mean by non-standardized test measures? Um, something that, for people that are just skeptical of standardized exams generally, um, which there are certainly many, um, are there any, is there anything else that might validate this, these sorts of results? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, PISA contains actually a broad vari variety of tasks. You know, we have uh, some multiple choice tasks, you know, typical kind of standardized test questions. We have some open-ended constructed tasks that are actually rated by humans. So uh, where students have to solve quite complex problems and uh, engage with the tasks at the fair level of depth where they have to demonstrate the a level of conceptual understanding. This is not simply, you know, a, a bubble sheet task where students have to, you know, reproduce specific subject matter. Con that's all I can say to this. We, we try to actually offer a broad range of different task types to capture a wide range of uh, <coughs> uh, response behavior. No, but. Um, is always, you know, the, the best test uh, that you can make is to look at to what extent those kind of outcomes predict uh, subsequent success in life. We have done some longitudinal studies in a number of countries where we followed up the 15 year olds in the case of Canada for actually another 15 years. So you could actually see to what extent uh, the test measures translated into, you know, employment or other social outcomes. That's, I think, the best that, uh, that, that I can, can offer. Thank you. If you are interested in this particular uh, work, uh, the report on this is called Pathways to Success, which followed students up uh, longitudinal and looked at the predictive power of their scores at age 15. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we have another question uh, from Andrew. Andrew, please go ahead. Have countries changed uh, how they use and respond to PISA as they become more familiar with the exam and what it measures and represents? 
Well, you know, I think uh, it that that varies really a lot. You know, some countries have um, uh, you know the the, the competency based approach to assessment that is quite different from traditional kind of uh, tests has become more common across OECD countries. You know, the, for example, the inclusion of open-ended tasks in uh, university entrance exams and so on is now quite common. I can't say that, you know, that was induced by PISA, but certainly PISA was using those kinds of tasks from the beginning. More countries are doing this. Uh, there has been um, greater emphasis in a number of countries on, you know, conceptual understanding in uh, curriculum design, curriculum implementation. I would even, you know, if you could even look at the United States, when you look at um, the uh, uh, Common Core attempt, that was very much inspired by uh, PISA and the highest performing education systems on this. So I think those are the kind of efforts that are quite common across OECD countries, sort of. To, it's not necessarily learning from PISA, but it's learning from the high performing education systems in PISA. Now, the United Kingdom, for example, has done a lot to uh, emulate or learn from a mathematics teaching in, uh, in, uh, in in China. So I think you can uh, see those kinds of examples in, in various forms across countries. But it's often, you know, peer learning from high performing countries rather than just, you know, learning directly from PISA. Uh, and Following up on a long past question, uh, the adaptive version of the test is new in uh, 2018, and uh, your approach to uh, missing questions is also new. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And that's quite important because um, uh, PISA is now catering for a very wide range of countries, uh, visibilities, and uh, we wanted to make sure that the test is relevant for every student that students don't get frustrated because the test is too hard or that they don't get bored because the test is too easy. So the adaptive approach, I think, has significantly improved uh, uh, measurement. And it's just the beginning. You know, we are still, you know, adapting at the block level. And the uh, treatment of, you know, missing student responses uh, also is a consequence of that. In an adaptive format, uh, there is just no specific end of the test book, but that process is just, you know, adaptive. So we had to adopt this. We also feel that treating uh, not given responses as missing is a, is a more valid way of dealing with non-response than treating them as wrong. Uh, and that has been debated for quite some time in, in the PISA assessment. And Are all students being administered the adaptive test now? Actually, there is, um, in, in a few countries, there is a still an old paper-based version. These are seven countries, I think, where we didn't use the uh, kind of adaptive test. We also have uh, for students with special needs a kind of um, a simplified version that was non-adaptive. That's just a short kind of uh, booklet, but these are just sort of uh, small numbers. Most students really take this adaptive version. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dana, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I have two questions. The first, I wanted to uh, follow up on Mariah's good question about achievement gaps. The country snapshot for the USA describes the achievement gap as stable in reading and math and narrowing in science. So I just wanted to confirm, are achievement gaps indeed stable or are they growing in some way? Uh, if you look at the, it depends what you look at the uh, achievement gap. If the achievement gap is a social and economic gap, it is stable. Uh, if you look at the performance gap, you can see that the share of high-performing students in the United States has increased, uh, which is not seen at the lower end of the performance spectrum. Okay, that's extremely helpful. And then a second question I have, um, I'm not sure if you're, I'm sure you are aware of NAEP, which is our national test, which is um, yep. also a low stakes exam. I mean, I'm finding this report to be less depressing <laughs> than the recent NAEP results. I mean, that showed, you know, quite bad news in reading declines even at the highest levels of achievement. You're showing the opposite here. Yep. Um, that looked a little bit worse for reading than for math. Again, here you're showing better for reading, worse for math. How do you square what could be maybe the, the differing kind of results or emphases there? 
You know, I think in part it's the maybe the which age group in the NAEP are you referring to? Uh, well, I'm referring to fourth and eighth grade, and I I know that this yeah, is fifteen yeah. age fifteen, so that's yeah. Different. Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, age, but the age group is not so different. I think uh, that, that should not explain a lot, at least the age grade, a lot of the difference. Um, in part, it may be the nature of the assessment. Again, you know, NAEP is, I would, when I look at the example items, I would look at more the typical school test where, you know, the reproduction of specific subject matter content is prevalent. The tasks are often very short. In uh, PISA, the tasks are often long. You get, you know, blocks of tasks working together. So but that, that those things may contribute to the observed differences. But I really don't have uh, any specific, uh, I'm not aware of a linking study between NAEP and uh, PISA. So I okay. think that would be the only way to find out. OK, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question from Tonel. Please uh, go ahead. Oh, hi. I am wondering if you could uh, give the country with the most growth. I'm thinking it might be there are four provinces in China, but I'm not sure. Yeah, you know, for the four provinces in China, we don't have trend data, but obviously the results are very impressive. You know, that's, I think, very clear. Uh, I think a high performing country with good growth is uh, Singapore where you can see they started already well and keep improving, or <clears throat> Estonia, where you also saw that uh, they have now become, you know, the number one among the OECD countries. So, yeah, there's a fair number of countries that have moved from good to great, really. Uh, there are others who've been catching up, uh, uh, but the majority of countries have been uh, stable, and that is true for the United States as well. Great. Uh, we have a question via text from Kathy. During the testing process, how much access do students have to digital tools to help them find answers? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. We provide some digital uh, tools that are hard-coded in the test where people can look up things and so on, but we have not yet given students access to the internet and sort of to look for non kind of standardized tools for information access. That's a hotly debated kind of topic. Uh, but so far, you know, it's a digital test. PISA is electronically delivered and there are certain tools provided in the test itself, but they are the same for all students. Great. Uh, we have only a couple of minutes left. So are there any final questions? Uh, feel free to send me a chat or uh, just uh, type in a, a, a quick, I have a question in the, uh, the Q&A box uh, so that I can uh, unmute your line. Okay, I think that is it for today. Um, I want to thank you, Andreas, and thank you everyone for attending today's embargoed briefing ahead of tomorrow's uh, results. I just want to remind you the contents of this briefing uh, and the country notes and the report are under embargo until 3 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow, December 3rd, 3 a.m. Eastern Time. If you have any questions or clarifications about the embargo time, please give me a call. I'm on 202-822-3865. I'll also mention that this webinar is being recorded and I will send you all a, a recording as soon as, as it is available. On behalf of the OECD, thank you for your interest in our work and have a great rest of your day.